so experiment nine we are trying to make or synthesize alum we would have made, synthesized alum it's a wet lab uh, it's one of those labs that is looks scary to students because there's a lot of gases produced if you forget and do it outside the hood fume hood you'll be coughing and crying because of hydrogen gas the reactions are violent and they're, 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 they're exothermic. So I would say you missed the fun uh, because of this COVID thing, COVID-19. So anyway, alum or alum, I call it alum, the British way. It's called alum because of the aluminum. Okay, it's used for so many purposes. You can Google and see the tons of applications of this compound product called alum. So to make it, we'll have to do some four steps of reaction. So we'll try to explore the synthesis of, of alum uh, following four basic elementary chemical steps. Uh, and then do the purifications by vacuum filtration. There's gonna be two filtrations for step one and step four. And then uh, do the math for theoretical and percentage yield based on the limiting reactant. So we'll first find the limiting reagent. After finding the limiting reagent, we will find the theoretical yield and then use the theoretical yield to calculate the percentage yield. For purpose number three, uh, we will not do it uh, because we are we are on virtual lab right now. So uh, alum, it's a class of chemical compounds having the formula M. M stands for a metal. Depending on what base you use, if you use potassium hydroxide, then M will be K. If you're using sodium hydroxide, M will be Na. Okay, so step one of the synthesis, <clears throat> We'll be reacting aluminum, aluminum, the element in the periodic table with potassium hydroxide dissolved in water. That part of water will donate six equivalents of water molecules to have a complete set of reactants, which will give you the first, uh, the first intermediate. We call this an intermediate because it's gonna be used in the second step. It won't show up in the overall reaction to give you the first intermediate, uh, potassium aluminum tetrahydroxide. All right, so now uh, hydrogen gas will be produced. Like I said, this is the guy that would have made you sneeze, cough, cry, and all those things in the lab if you don't do the reaction the fume hood. So for safety purposes, we always use the fume hood, four of them in the, in the lab, we use the fume hood to trap all these poisonous gases and fumes, which would have been, for example, in this lab, hydrogen gas. Now, what's really happening in this reaction? So focusing on aluminum, it's a metal. So the oxidation state of aluminum is gonna be zero and it's oxidized to aluminum three. Oh, how did I know that? I have to look at the product containing aluminum, which happens to be this product right here, potassium aluminum tetrahydroxide. Um, so we need to determine the charge, the oxidation state of the aluminum or the charge on the AL. To do that, we break the molecule apart to K plus because K is in group one. I expect it to have a charge of plus one. It's a metal, it gets a charge of plus. The other part that's bracketed uh, is gonna be having a charge of minus. Why, why do we expect this to have a minus? So, it, so the charge, the negative will neutralize the positive because this molecule overall does not have charge. So now that we have this part here, we're gonna break it down. <clears throat> we're going to break it down. So aluminum, has an unknown oxidation state, which we need to find. And then we have four OHs. Each OH has a charge of minus one. Now, overall, if you add the oxidation state of aluminum and the four OHs, it should give us the negative. 
which is outside the bracket. So we know that hydroxides have a charge of minus one. That's something you need to know by memorization. It's a polyatomic anion, which has a charge of minus one. So summing up the charge of aluminum that we don't know and the charge, total charge of contribution by the hydroxide, we should get negative one, which again is for everything that's bracketed. So to find the charge of aluminum, this side will be minus four, take it out the other side is gonna be plus four. So which means aluminum has a charge of plus three in the product, that's where we get this number right here. So anyway, it's oxidized from zero to plus three. The oxidation number increases, that's the definition, one of the definitions of oxidation. Oxidation can be defined as one, addition of oxygen, two, increase in oxidation number, which is happening here on aluminum from zero to plus three. Three, removal of hydrogens, that's the third uh, definition of oxidation, removal of hydrogens. Four, loss of electrons. Actually here, aluminum, aluminum is, our aluminum is losing electrons, three electrons from, to gain to gain the oxidation state of plus three because each electron is negatively charged. If you're losing three negative charges, then you're ending up with three positive charges and that's what we term as oxidation. Now that's not the only uh, change we're having on this first step, on this first reaction where aluminum reacts with the potassium hydroxide. We also see that the water is changed to turns out to, to lose the oxygen to, to, to get the hydrogen gas. Now remember, if oxidation is addition of oxygen, then loss of oxygen is reduction. So the water is reduced to hydrogen gas. It lost the oxygen that was supposed to be here. Now we have hydrogen gas. So uh, uh, water is reduced. So the reactions where, in reactions where you have oxidation and oxi oxidation and reduction taking place, we call those reactions redox reactions because there's reduction, the red part, and there's oxidation, so redox reactions. So the first step is a redox reaction because aluminum is changed, changes its oxidation number from zero to plus three, and the water is changed to hydrogen gas, you're losing oxygen, that's reduction. Now, once the reaction is done, you need to get this ionic compound. It's ionic, obviously, you see K plus and the negative charge of aluminum tetrahydroxide. That compound needs to be a, needs to be isolated or purified. So we purify it by filtration because it's ionic. One would expect it to stay in water. It's highly soluble in water. Ionic compounds are highly soluble in water. Uh, so you uh, you filter out any unreacted aluminum, which would have made, been supplied by the aluminum foil, pieces of aluminum foil. So to do the filtration, which is the first filtration, you set up a vacuum suction filtration setup, okay, which uh, you have to suck the air out of the flask. Okay, so your 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 funnel will have filter paper, and then you drain this liquid containing all this mess, except the hydrogen gas which ex escapes in air. All these other guys might be in the reaction mixture. So you just pour, pour the reaction mixture through the filter paper, collect the liquid that passes through. This process is called filtration, which means the liquid that is collected down there is gonna be called the filtrate. The filtrate contains potassium aluminum tetrahydroxide. It contains some of the excess base. It contains the water and, it, and what else? Those are the only ones that are contained in there. Any unreacted aluminum will be trapped on the filter paper as somewhat black residue. So the filtrate is taken to the next, next step and most likely the filtrate mostly contains this product, KALO4. I called it an intermediate because it's, it's formed and then taken to the next step here. So which means overall it will not exist. 
we'll see that in the next slide. So now in step two, we do uh, add the first, first portion, portion of sulfuric acid. So which is that? The question is balanced with sulfuric acid having a one before it. So you add sulfuric acid, first portion of sulfuric acid, you get, um, you get aluminum hydroxide, try, uh, aluminum hydroxide and K-sulfate. K-sulfate will be used, this is gonna be, this is another intermediate. That's an intermediate, uh, this is an intermediate. How do I know? It's gonna be used up in step three. So intermediate, this is used, used in step three. It's made here, but it's used in step three. This is an intermediate made here, but it's gonna be used in step four. So you'll not see it in the over equation of reaction. Because if you make something and use it, then it's no longer there. We call such intermediates, not spectator ions, we call them intermediates. Okay, so um, you added your first portion of sulfuric acid uh, to your filtrate that you obtained from step one. And then after that, you are reacting the product, the same, 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 same liquid that you started with. You, you're reacting the product with a second portion of sulfuric acid, which means you're forcing the reaction to go to completion. So this time you're adding a little bit more of sulfuric acid. Here you add one equivalent, here you have three equivalents. And what that does is the sulfate of sulfuric acid is gonna replace uh, uh, part of the OH. It's gonna replace the OH. And then you get aluminum sulfate plus water. Okay. This is another intermediate. The aluminum sulfate is another intermediate because it's gonna be used up. It's made here, but it's gonna be used up. Okay. And so intermediate is gonna be used up in step four. <clears throat> so you make aluminum sulfate and some water. Then now you come here and use up your aluminum sulfate. So it looks like you're making something and then you use it in the, success, in the, in the successive step, uh, in the next step of the reaction. So you take your aluminum sulfate, this time you're reacting with K-sulfate. Where did K-sulfate come from? It's not added. It's part of step two products. Uh, where is step two? It's part of this guy. Remember I said it's gonna be used in step four. It's in the same, same liquid you started with. It start, it's, its ions are just dancing around in the solvent, waiting to react. Excuse me. Okay, so now aluminum sulfate made in step three reacts with potassium sulfate made in step two. And of course the solvent is water, 24 portions, 24 equivalents of water used are gonna be used up from the solvent uh, in the flask. And then you end up with our alum. So that's the story of making alum. Notice that the alum has 12 water of crystallization like we discussed in the experiment concerning uh, hydrates, uh, formula of hydrates. Okay, so now, Combining steps one through four, we can derive the overall reaction below, and it's all derived by, it's derived by canceling out, by canceling out intermediates. I already pointed out to you what the intermediates are. So all those that were pointed out to be intermediates, they're gonna be canceled because they are made and used up. So one of the intermediates so we, it's like summing up all these reactant, reactants from step one. Aluminium is, was not formed and used up 
at the same time. So that stays. We'll talk about water later. Potassium hydroxide was not formed and used up. So 2AL and KOH, 2KOH stay. So that's, we have counted for that and that. They were, those were not intermediates. Uh, sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid, we added one equivalent, step one, uh, step two, and three equivalents, step three. One plus three, you get four. So that accounts for these four right there. And then let's see where the 22 comes by. But I wouldn't have included the 22. It's just because of balancing anyway, because that gets confusing because I see six and two, and I don't see how I will just simply, oh, I see. I see how I can account for it. So these six waters that are here used up, they are made here, okay? So those those two waters, those six equivalents of waters are, act as an intermediate. But we have two more waters here that are formed, okay? Those are formed, and then you have 24 here that are used. So 24 minus two gives you 22, okay? So the water has been accounted for. I thought I would it, but it, it has been accounted for completely. And then obviously we have our alum and we have our hydrogen gas that never canceled. We have our hydrogen gas here that never canceled three equivalents. So if you combine the four products, canceling out all intermediates possible, then you end up with this overall reaction that you need to know. Because it's gonna be this overall reaction that will be used up, that will be used to calculate for all calculations in your report sheet. So that's a very important uh, balanced overall equation of reaction that you need to know. Do you have a question to that point? Unmute your mic and uh, ask. We are about to go to the report. If you have a question, I'm giving you your chance to, I'm giving you a chance to ask. Okay, so it seems there's no question. So let's wind up the PowerPoint. So we will use the overall equation right there to determine the limiting reactant. The limiting reactant is gonna be the reagent that gives the lowest amount of product possible without any errors encountered. So let's say you're doing a reaction and you're as perfect as you can be. Not even one microgram is lost or not even one nanogram is lost. No solvent is lost, no temperature mistakes, no flask is broken. The limiting reactant should give you the lowest amount of product possible. Then once you determine the limit, limiting reactant um, or during the determination of limiting reactant, you can determine the theoretical yield, which is the lowest amount of product possible determined by the limiting reactant, obviously. And then one more step that you need to show and calculate in your reports is the percentage yield. The actual yield, the amount of product that you actually got in the lab divided by the expected amount of product that you should have obtained without any errors. If all goes well, they multiply by 100. Most students forget to multiply by 100. This would have been the setup for filtration, whereby you would pour out your, filt your, your mixture through the filter paper on the funnel, and then the filter will go down by help of suction, pressure suction through the tube. Okay, this tube usually goes through, is usually connected through a suction pump or it's connected through a, a tap that you saw in the video somewhere on Muru, the two videos I posted for the experiment. 
Okay, so now let's go to the uh, reactions. Let's see. Let's go through the, oops. Let's go through the report. So I'm gonna walk through trial one and you should walk trial two. I'm just trying to make things easy for you so you'll turn in this report as soon as you can. So I'm given the mass of aluminum as 1.000 grams, and then I'm given the volume of KOH. I'm also given the molarity of KOH. Moles is equal to the another equation for moles. Moles to find moles, you just multiply the molarity by the volume. So moles equals to molarity you multiply by the volume. Remember, as we did in last lab, virtual lab, volume must be in liters. So that's why we are given the volume and the concentration, volume and the concentration, because we'll have to apply this formula right there to find the moles. And then you're given the actual yield that was obtained. This data came from last lab, uh, last semester's lab, one of the section did this experiment, and that's what they found, and we're gonna use that as an illustration. So I'll show you how to work through trial one boxes. And uh, of course you'll fill them up. I'm not gonna fill them up right now. I'll just show you the process and then you will do trial two. So let's go for it. So remember I've given one gram of aluminum. First question is show, it says show. If you don't show, you lose points. Show all no assumptions, all calculations for trial, trial one for me, trial two for you, moles of aluminum and theoretical yield of aluminum formed. So let's do the moles. So moles equal to, because you are given the mass of aluminum to be one gram. So moles will be equal to the mass, given mass divided by the atomic mass of aluminum. which is gram per mole, so I'll put the mole up here, applying math, math rules. So you divide that, I'm getting the moles to be one divided by 27. What's one divided by 27? I'm getting it to be 0 0.0370, uh, four moles of aluminum. So how will I find the moles of, how do I find the moles of um, uh, the theoretical yield of alum? To do that, I have to find the moles of alum. So the strategy is this, you convert the grams of aluminum, convert that to, to moles, of aluminum, which is what we just did. I just did this because the question wanted us to show that part only. And then convert the moles of al aluminum to moles of alum. And then once you have the moles of alum, this, the next strategy on the map is to convert the moles of alum to moles of, uh, to mass of alum. Okay, to mass of alum and we're gonna need it to be in grams, all right? Mass, mass of alum in grams. So that's the strategy. So now uh, we were given, we found the moles already. So I'm gonna use those moles. Uh, and then convert the moles, so I'm here. I found the moles of aluminum already, so I need to, no. I'm here. I found the moles of aluminum already. Now I need to find the moles of alum. So I cannot do that unless I look at the equation of reaction. So let's see, what is the equation of reaction? Um, here it is. Let me try and... Uh, Come on, slides. I don't want to rewrite this whole thing. I want to import it onto my. Uh, 
going to import it onto my chart. Uh, reduce the font with my mouse. Bear with me, let me resize this equation to where we can see it. Okay, and then I don't need that. Okay, let's create some space. All right, so there is our equation, balanced equation of reaction. Uh, so I said we have to convert the moles of aluminum to moles of alum and then convert the moles of alum to mass of alum, which will give us the theoretical yield. Whatever answer we get is the theoretical yield. So to convert the moles of aluminum to moles of alum, I'm gonna use the reacting ratios. Of course, it's gonna be two for every two mole of aluminum, I get two moles, I get two moles of alum. Okay, that's simple enough. So which means I can do ratios. I, I can tell myself, all right, I know that two moles of alum will always be obtained when I react two moles of aluminum. But I have 0 0.03704 aluminum, moles of aluminum. So I multiply by the conversion factors that helps me to cancel out those units. And then I used another conversion factor to convert the moles of alum, which is the SI unit left in our problem, in our calculations, to grams. So um, you have to multiply by the formula weight of alum, which is 474.36 or 39, depending on the periodic table that you're using. That much grams is equivalent to one mole of alum. Okay, so three, 474, 474.39 uh, grams of alum is equivalent to one mole of alum. So that will help me again to cancel out this unit. So my final answer will be grams of alum and that will happen to be the theoretical yield just in case aluminum, aluminum turns out to be the limiting reactant. We don't know yet. We'll have to do all the math to determine who is the limiting reactant. So do the math. I'm getting, uh oh, let's see. Okay, so let's see, one divided by 27 equals two, multiply by 474.39 equals two. Okay, so the answer I'm getting from this math is 17.57 grams of alum. So if aluminum, if aluminum was aluminum was limiting, then the grams possible, the yield possible for of alum is 17.57. Remember, the limiting reactant will give you the least theoretical yield. So let's test for for KOH. What if KOH was limiting? We are given the molarity of KOH to be, I think it's 1.4. Let's confirm. Uh, uh, yeah, KOH is 1.4, the volume is 50 ml. You don't want to work with mLs, so V will be 0 0.050 liters. So you need to show how you'll find the moles of KOH. So moles, KOH, is gonna be equal to molarity, which is moles per liter times volume in liters. And in this case, it's 1.4 moles per liter. That's what molarity means, times the volume, which is 0 0.050 L. L and L cancel out, cancels out. We are getting the answer to be 0 0.05 over by 1.4. We are getting the answer here to be 0 0.07 uh, 
0.70 moles of KOH. So I've answered this part. Theoretical yield of alum according to trial one, you'll do for trial two, you have to do your own and see if it's the same. Theoretical yield will have to follow the trend again. We know that if we, we have if we have the moles of KOH, with the map will be to convert moles of KOH to moles moles of alum, and then from moles of alum, we can find the grams. We we can find the grams of alum. That will be the strategy. That will be the method. So. We already found the moles of KOH, so I'll get 0 0.070 moles of KOH. I'm going to multiply it by the conversion factor. I see that for every two moles of KOH, I get two moles of alum. So to convert it to moles of alum, I'm gonna use that conversion factor. So two moles of alum always will be coming from two moles of KOH. Two moles of KOH. Now you want it written like that so that the moles of KOH will cancel out and your answer at this point is moles of alum, which is convertible to grams of alum. So we use another conversion factor. We know that for every one mole of alum, you get a mass of 374.9 grams of alum per mole of alum. And again, I want the mole of alum, alum to be the denominator using this method of this proportion, whatever they call it. Uh, so we, we are able to cancel out these units. Moles of alum is canceling out. So the answer should be in grams of alum. Let's do the math and see how much alum is obtainable, pretending that KOH is limiting. So 0 0.07 multiplied by 474.39. Uh, I'm getting the answer here to be 33.2. Uh, Actually, it's just going to be 33 grams of alum. So, so far, aluminum is winning as a limiting reactant because it's giving us um, aluminum is giving us the uh, the least um, theoretical yield of the product okay so so far aluminum is winning so let's test for sulfuric acid so the question asks you to show the moles of sulfuric acid that reacted Okay, so let's see. My pen is. So we need to find the most of sulfuric acid that reacted. We know the molarity of sulfuric acid used is 4.0. Is it 4.0? Let's check. 4.00. The volume is 20 ml. So 4.00 moles per liter, that's the concentration. And we know that the volume is 20 ml. Again, you want to use it in liters. So divide by a thousand. So if you want to find the moles, like we did last lab, is it last lab or the titration lab, is gonna be molarity times volume, which in this case will be 4.00 moles, 4.00 moles per uh, moles per liter. You are multiplying it by 0 
zero zero uh, zero point zero two liters that's the 20 ml l and l goes your answer should be in liters turns out to be 0 0.0880 moles of sulfuric acid okay h2so4 so you answer the first part of the question you need to find the theoretical yield to find the theoretical yield <coughs> We follow the same strategy. So it's going to be moles. Uh, it will be moles of sulfuric acid. Convert that to moles of alum. See, I'm showing all my work. Moles of alum. And then convert the moles of alum to grams of alum. That's the theoretical yield. That will give you the theoretical yield, assuming sulfuric was limiting we don't know yet so i have 0 0.080 moles of sulfuric acid from our immediate calculations that we just did we will multiply that by the conversion factor to convert to moles of alum using our equation so if you go back to equation of reaction for every four moles of sulfuric acid based on the coefficients for every four moles of sulfuric acid you get two moles of alum okay so the reaction is two to four alum to sulfuric acid so that gives us the conversion factor for every two moles of alum okay you get four moles of sulfuric acid. Okay. So next, we multiply that by the formula weight which is 474.39 grams of alum is equivalent to one mole of alum. We need that setup because you want the units to cancel out. Always track your units. They need to cancel out to know that you're doing the right thing. So the answer will be in grams of alum. I think by now you've done the math of 84.39 times 0 0.08 goes to divide by two. So the answer I'm getting here is 18.9. Let me just say 976 grams of alum. Moving back, I see two significant figures. So again, this will be 19 grams of alum. So let's compare the theoretical yields because these masses you're getting are theoretical yields, assuming whatever you're testing is uh, limiting. So if a sulfuric acid was limiting, then the, the possible amount of um, the alum is 19 grams. If potassium hydroxide was limiting, then you get 33 grams possible of alum. If aluminum was limiting, the possible mass is 17.57, which means aluminum should be the limiting reactant. Okay. AL is the limiting, is the limiting reagent because it gives you the least amount of product according to what we defined how we defined in the powerpoint so that means the theoretical yield you need to adapt right now is going to be this this is the true theoretical yield that you need to adapt to calculate your percentage yield so moving back down here to do our percentage yield remember the formula so percentage yield of alum 
there's a drug because my computer is breathing, breathing heavily. Percentage yield of alum is gonna be equal to actual, the actual yield divided by theoretical yield. The actual yield is provided to you in the table. So I'm just gonna write TY here and then multiply by 100. TY is a theoretical yield. So what's the actual yield? What was really obtained in the lab? So after the whole synthesis, someone obtained 3.172 of dry product of alum. So we're gonna put it here as the actual 3.172 grams alum divided by the theoretical, which is 17 point, is it 5.7? Come on, pen. Let's see, 17.57. Clean up to make sure it looks good. So 17.57. Grams alum. Everything multiplied by 100. Don't forget. I almost forgot. So the units cancel out again. So 3.172 divided by 17.57 times 100. I'm getting my answer to be 18.0. 5%. Let me look at my theoretical yield. I posted my significant figures there as 17.57 because the table, the table gave me four significant figures of alum. Let me see if there's anything else that needed to translate. Mm. Yeah, I'll have to use uh, uh, four significant figures for the percentage. So that is the that's how you uh, you will do for trial trial one. For me, I've shown you the example on using trial one. You need to work on trial two. Is there any question concerning the calculations and the experiment? This is going to be posted I think on I'm done. Moodle, correct? I give you five seconds and mute your mic. Everything clear. All right. I'll process the video in the next one hour and put it under experiment nine resources. If you need to review while you are writing your report, feel free to play back and pause the YouTube video that I'll post out of this lecture after we end and processing it, it takes about 30 minutes to process. Okay, so where are we?